Hello, hello, and welcome to Catalyst MLM. I'm Brian Switchko, and today on the show, we have Judy Boger. Judy worked as a nurse, an office manager, and a skiing coach before discovering multi-level marketing through a company called Nikon in 1992. She has since reached her top rank of Royal Diamond, built an extensive business around the world, and helped many other people to achieve similar success. Thanks so much for being on today. Good morning, or good afternoon, however the case may be. <laughs> So I I met you ages ago, and every time I see you or even hear your voice, you just make me smile. And um, I just, awesome for so many reasons, which I'm going to try and highlight throughout the interview. But uh, tell me a little bit more about how you went from, you know, nurse, office manager, skiing coach to successful multi-level marketer. Well, it's, it was kind of interesting because somebody came to my office who was being prospected by another network marketer. And I had been prospected for years to have people try to get me in either this business or that business. And uh, I just didn't want anything to do with it. But this guy happened to hit me at, at the right time. I had one son in college at, at an expensive school and another son getting ready to go to school. And so I was kind of looking for some, some way to make some extra money. I didn't want to take college loans out to pay for the boys' education. So I, I was, in fact, I was starting a jewelry business. I, I thought, you know, I'll have house parties for jewelry. Everybody wants jewelry, and I thought, what I don't sell, I can wear. So it was a win-win a situation. And uh, But this guy came in and, and said he wanted me to take a look at what he was doing because he wanted to wanted my opinion to see if he should join. So he wasn't prospecting me as such. He was being prospected and uh, I had taught skiing with him and so I said, oh sure. I said, why, why are you asking my opinion? And he said, because you're, you're a nurse and Roger's a, a dentist, but my ex is a dentist. And, and he said, and I thought, you know, you might, you might know something about these products. I'd like your opinion. And so I looked at it and I said, well, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm going to do it. I, I want to sell these. And so this guy was so inexperienced in network marketing, he didn't even take me to an opportunity meeting. He said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what we need to do next because I'm going to a meeting tonight. <laughs> and he didn't even ask me to go. So the next day he came in the office with applications and said, um, here, you have to fill this out. And he said, but fax mine in first because I'm your sponsor. <laughs> so he hadn't I even said, signed as a distributor yet? He had not even he filled it all out, but he hadn't sent it in. And so the, the meeting he'd been to, they said, just be sure yours is faxed in before mine was faxed in. And so he, he came in. And, of course, in 92, not everybody had a fax machine, and now it's like, it's sitting there and what do we do with it, you know? Yep. But um, so I faxed his application in and faxed mine in and we ordered some product. And um, I just thought I, they, uh, the products just fascinated me. And I thought, well, let's see if they work. So I was just going to sell products. I wasn't going to tell anybody it was network marketing because I didn't have any respect for network marketing. But that's because I didn't know anything about network marketing. I was really kind of... Uh, um, ignorant of all the facts, but uh, within two months, um, I had people, you know, I was selling enough products, but not, you know, not wonderfully great amounts, and then two of the people I sold products to said, hey, can I sell these too? That's when I realized I was being like an ostrich with my head in the sand, so it was time to get my head out of the sand and actually look at the business side of it, not just the product side of it, and actively try to build a business. So I sponsored those two, and the company had a, um, a promotion going on where you sponsor two people every month to get to the very first level. And uh, so that was my goal then, to sponsor two people every month for six months to get to that first, that first level. And uh, I think that's what kept me going because there was a goal, yep. and there was a an award I could get by doing what I should have done anyhow. And so the first month I sponsored those two, well, the first month that I actually did the business, I sponsored those two people. And then the second month I sponsored five. And the third month I sponsored three. And, you know, by that time the people I sponsored, I was helping them and having them focus on doing the same thing I was doing. And um, it started growing. 
Yeah. And within four months, I was making, uh, I made $5,000 within four months of doing the business. It was six months of starting the, signing the app, but right. four months of starting the business. And I made $5,000. And my goal was to make 2500 And so I was very excited, needless to say, because I was, you know, I was getting positive reinforcement for the work I was putting in. And I think that's the most important thing when you're, Bringing somebody into this business, make sure they make money quickly. Yep. Otherwise, you know, they, they don't see the value. And if they don't start building a business quickly, they won't see the value. And out of those people that I sponsored in those first six months, um, all my big legs came from that. And that was in 1992. Now... Not all of those people were sponsored, but the person I sponsored may have sponsored somebody who sponsored somebody who sponsored somebody. And so those big legs came from those first, those first six months of uh, actively building the business. And, of course, there were other people that I've sponsored. You know, I've sponsored many people over the years. But I think that first initial push and seeing a vision for the future and being able to share that vision was what got the business going. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's really powerful in terms of getting people to make money fast. And that's, I think you're actually the person that I originally learned that from, which is that if you get people excited, I mean, I've, I mean, I remember getting, actually, I remember the exact penny with like the first check of every company I've ever been a part of is $13 and 72 cents. Yes. And you just, yeah. you get so excited. And, and it's, I mean, I think it's partially because it's outside of a job and you did it entirely yourself and, and there's that. And then there's the other part of it of like, it's, it's the beginning of something bigger, but kind of, it's, oh, it's, go ahead. Like, it's like anything, you know, you, you have to know, I said about a vision and you have to know where you want to go. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. <laughs> and so nobody wants to get on a train if they don't know where the train is going. And if you want people to join your train, you have to know where you're going and where the train is going. And so you have to have that vision of knowing what you're going to be doing, where you're going to be going, and, and you have to have your story ready to let people know that you're in not the network marketing uh, industry, you're in the network marketing profession. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And and kind of stepping back a little bit, you talked about how, you know, you – you had a goal and you wanted to, you know, sponsor two people a month for six months. And, and that was what you wanted to do to, to get your achievement and get the bonus. But a lot of people set those goals and then, you know, they don't always happen. You know, like we, we work for them, we strive for them, we, we align with people to help us, but they don't always happen. And a lot of times it can, it can really hurt and kind of, you know, if you don't do it the first month, it can hurt the second, the third and the fourth. So would you say that you were emotionally unattached from your results when you were doing that? Or, or were you just like, what was your frame of mind as you were working towards that goal? Um, no, I, I was looking at the results because, um, yes, we had a very nice life. We had uh, a second home down in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. um, we had all of the trappings of a good life, but we also had all of the, the bills. So our, our bills were exponentially as big as the things that we had and I was I was feeling stressed before I got involved in the business because I you know like I said I wasn't sure how we were going to pay for the college and uh, the boys had picked expensive schools and I I just hated feeling like I was getting pushed down more and more and the thought of seeing an, a check that would pay for both colleges and John wasn't even in school yet. He was still a senior in high school. And so it was like, oh, that's cool. You know, <laughs> I, that's what got me excited. The fact that I was seeing these checks with a, a comma on them, you know, <laughs> yeah. every check has a period, but I like checks with commas on them. And so to see that the, as soon as I got the, the first check that had a comma on it, that had me hooked, and my goal then was to make sure each check each month was, if not the same, a little bit bigger. And once in a while, it would be lower, and um, I get discouraged because I thought it was this is a good check, but it's not as good as the one last month. And that's when I uh, got a mentor and got somebody who actually knew 
about the business and the industry and the profession of network marketing. And once I, I talked to Reed Nelson, was the guy I talked to, um, then I started seeing what I needed to do. And also there's a book and it's called being, I was just looking to see if I had it within arm's reach and I don't. It's Which, called Being the Best You Can Be in MLM by John K. Lynch. Oh, that one I don't have within arm's reach. <laughs> I, uh, I was like, there's a good chance that what you're about to say is within arm's reach of me, but it's not. It's right here. <laughs> it's being the best you can be in MLM. Yeah. And, uh, and I, he gave me that book to read. And um, it just, it really, I loved it because it was like a cookbook. You know, it showed me what I needed to do to get the results that I wanted to get. Uh, if you're going to make a cake, you don't just say, okay, I'm going to start throwing things in and hope I get out, you know, turn out with a cake. And uh, so you use a cookbook. And so you, you follow the recipe and you make your cake, but you have to bake it too and then wait for it to cool and ice it. And some people, yeah. when they get involved in this business, they make the cake, but they don't put it in the oven and then don't understand <laughs> and, and my, why they're successful. My other favorite metaphor is used differently, but it applies here, is that if you put a cake in the oven at 600 degrees, the outside of it burns and the inside is gooey. You have to put it in and you have to do it consistently for the time required so that the cake cooks all the way through and then you let it cool or if you put the icing on too soon then the icing melts and I've done that yeah. before because I wanted to eat some cake yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah you definitely do have to be patient and I think that's that's a part of um they kind of it's a weird transition but uh one of the things that when I found Nikan um it was just something that I really loved and I've carried it way beyond that is called the five pillars of health and it's something that they teach all their distributors and uh, a healthy body, healthy mind, healthy family, healthy society and healthy finances are all the things that are needed for true health. And I wanted to kind of go through them one by one with you because I know that you have some interesting stories on all of them. Um, so the first one, healthy body. So, I mean, you know, I was always thought if you if you if you're not alive, then you can't keep living. You, know, you have to, you have yeah. to take care of yourself. So how is how has a healthy body helped you to grow your business? Well, I think that I'll being a nurse, in my mind, healthy body just meant free of disease. And uh, it's not, that's not the case. A healthy body is somebody who's uh, getting the proper exercise uh, close to their proper weight. I still have to shed a few. I shed a few, gained a few, but that's what we all do. And, but it's, it's having their body being, feeling the way at their optimum, mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. good, and not just feeling not sick. There's a difference there. And and I, you know, I, I'm not, not going to pump my products, except that I do feel younger now than I did when I got started in the business uh, 22 years ago almost. And it's, it's amazing how I just went to my high school class reunion. <laughs> <laughs> and that was so interesting because I saw some people and I thought, well, they don't have a healthy body. <laughs> and they, they, some of them. It was all the looked, jocks, wasn't it? Some of them, yeah. I mean, they were like, they just, well, most of the jocks, in fact, still looked pretty good. But there were a couple of other guys I'm looking at and I'm thinking, holy cow, I, I would never have known him because he was like this big around in high school and now he's this big around, you know. And it's just, it blew my mind that some people can um, let their bodies go and not just by eating and, and getting fat, but by doing nothing to 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 feel better and nothing to make themselves feel better I think if you're if you used to ski and you can't ski anymore or you used to play tennis and you can't play tennis anymore or you used to like to take walks and you can't walk anymore that's that's not a healthy body yeah. it's being able to do the things you want to do when you want to do them that's a healthy body yeah and, and you talked before about your kind of misconceptions about network marketing but you didn't have any information about it and I've seen the same thing in people is that they go, well, I'm, I'm this age, I, I have these problems, this is just how it works. And, you know, yeah. so often, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be anything miraculous. I mean, I've gotten into the habit of like Googling things of, you know, uh, I was cramping up when I ran and I go, how can I not cramp up when I run? Eat a banana. Okay, I ate a banana before I run. Now I eat a banana before I run, I don't cramp up. And, uh, you know, it's like just kind of asking the question, regardless of what the answer is saying, 
is this actually the case? Do I actually have to deal with this? And, you know, more energy and so on and so forth. And um, one of my other favorite quotes is, uh, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And that could be based on money and energy, but also weight. So, yes. I mean, have you have you worked with any distributors that, that got involved and, and, you know, maybe they just weren't of the right mindset in terms of their body and you had to say, look, this is how you grow your business and you need to kind of get rid of that mindset. You know, I used to jokingly say from the front of the room, never face to face with somebody because I didn't want to get hit. Uh, but I'd say you're going to your income for every pound that you, you lose in the next year will be an extra thousand dollars a month on your income. I love that. And I really I believe that if, if somebody wants to talk about healthy body and they're, you know, 50 pounds overweight, it's not impressive at least not to me and it's it's like you know it's like having kids that you, you can't tell them not to drink and smoke if you're sitting there you know hey don't drink and smoke i hate it but i'm doing it you know they 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 look at what you do and not what you say so right you know and and speaking of of mindset and kind of you know communicating that because it's not only within you it is how other people see you. And if you're just like, hey, check out these products and you're very bland about it and you're not excited, then people aren't going to get excited about it. So the, the second piece of their second pillar is healthy mind. And, yes. and uh, you know, without the mind, the body can't function. So um, what what did you have to do to create your own healthy mind and to create your healthy mindset? Again, being a nurse in my, uh, the first time I heard this at, at a NECAN opportunity meeting, a healthy body, healthy mind, and I thought a healthy mind to me was either sane or insane. There, you know, there, there really, there was, it was very black and white to me because of, of, my, of my nursing education. But I realized that there's a lot of gray area in there. And, um, you know, if you if you feel stressed, that's not a healthy mind. If you get home from work and you're snapping at your spouse or you're snapping at your kids or you're, you're at work and you're snapping at your underlings or your, your bosses, that's not a healthy mind. It, it's freedom from stress. And I, Nikan has something called Humans Being More Training, which I thought was a stupid name. I thought Humans Being More What? <laughs> and I, and I took, and it's, it was mandatory if you reach the first leadership level. So I took it, and it just, it really opened my mind to realize that it's, you know, there, you do have a lot of junk in there that you've, and the older you get, the more junk you can get put up there. I think that's why we turn gray because all this junk is turning us gray, but. I was able to really look at some of the things in my past life or, or, and, and see things for what they were, not what I thought they were. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a healthy mind to be able to look at, at where you are in life and, um, and see where you really are and, and not get so frustrated because sometimes what you're thinking isn't really the way it is. You've got this CD in your mind that you're playing over and over again because you heard it so many times when you were a kid and you start believing it because you're hearing it. So you need to get that CD out of that CD player in your brain and break it and throw it away because, you know, what you heard over and over and over again may not necessarily be the truth. It's the way you look at yourself because somebody made you look that way, but the way other people see you isn't really that way. So it, it makes you, healthy mind is knowing knowing where you are and being happy with what you are and um, being able to get rid of the junk. Yeah, absolutely. And you, and you spoke about stress and that's, I mean, a lot of people have stress. I would, I would reason to say that everyone has stress. And uh, there's actually a TED talk recently, which I found fascinating, and it included medical references, which made it more fascinating. Um, but she said that it was, uh, a, I think she was a doctor, and she was saying that, you know, she had touted how stress is evil and you shouldn't be stressed, you know, be stressed about not being stressed. And, um, and, and she did that for years until she found out that it's not the absence of stress, it's the acknowledgement that stress is your body's way of preparing you for the challenges that you're about to overcome. Yeah. And, and looking at it in a positive light. And literally they, they saw people have like a less, uh, less of a risk of heart attack just by doing that over the years. And it's, it, it broadcasts itself to people around you, which, which, you know, you, your contagious energy, so to speak. So how do you communicate that to people that are coming onto your team or people who aren't having a great time? How do you, 
you know, now that you have this solid mindset that you've developed for the last, you know, 20 years, how do you communicate that to someone who's new? Just st to stop looking at the negative and start looking at the positive. I, I have been an eternal optimist and I become more so. And uh, my good friend was just saying that she was getting, you know, she had something was breaking out in her face. And I said, you've been stressed. Stop worrying so much because everything you've worried about, most of the things you've been worried about, they're finished. And there was a good outcome. And so it was no big deal. So don't look at the bad things until you're, it's proved that, yeah, it's bad. I mean, you know, why worry about something that isn't even here? I mean, yes, it's, sometimes you do have to worry, but if you, if you can't provide a solution, don't even think about it until you're proved that, till it's, till it's there. Um, what you're worrying about may never even happen. And so don't think about the worst that could happen. Think about the best that could happen and aim for that. And it makes, it makes life more exciting by aiming for the best instead of looking for the worst. Yep. Yeah, and there's, there's definitely some, there's a lot of, I could have a whole different discussion about that because, you know, people, a lot of times they worry and they freak out and they, they have plan B and Q and R and so on and so forth. And, you know, you do have to be practical and you, you can't, you know, say, I'm going to quit my job, start building my multi-level marketing business today, and I'm going to be making full-time income by 30 days because cause I'm going to work really hard. You know, you can't, you can't be reckless, but also, you know, you can't, you can't worry about things you have no control over. And, and Hal Elrod, who I interviewed before, said that uh, worry is the act of projecting non-acceptance into the future. So you're projecting the fact that you don't accept the future, even though it hasn't happened yet. And uh, it's, it's a really powerful thing to just kind of be able to pull back from that. So you, you talked about mental barriers, and, and I think, and kind of touching on that, one of another favorite quote, I love quotes, um, is uh, the only walls that can hold you back are those that you build for yourself. So have you, I, I think you've had some, and, and have you, uh, your other uh, team members as well, had moments where they just had a realization where they're just like, wow, I never realized that I was doing that to me. Sometimes it's it's difficult for people to uh, to to realize that, and I don't like to tell people what they're doing wrong because that just gets people discouraged. Um, when I was teaching skiing, the best the person who was one of my um, uh, um, examiners, so to speak, at the ski instructor level. Uh, was saying always look at the good things and brag people up on the good things and then the bad things will just disappear. So if somebody skiing has their butt stuck out too far, instead of saying your butt stuck out too, sticks out too far, say instead, wow, stand, oh, you, you look really good. Stand a little taller and you'll even look better. So give them a solution to do what, to get rid of the problem instead of pointing out what the problem, because as soon as you, you point out to somebody their problem, they focus on the problem. It's human nature. You tell somebody you're saying, um, um, too much. And then they're going to go, um, oh, really? Oh, um, oh, you know, and yep. they can't get away from it because they're thinking about it so much. So if you just give them a positive thing to do and say you're speaking like for example in the ohm situation you can say wow you're really good speaking in front of a group you know if you pause by not saying anything after each sentence it makes the sentences sound much more important and they're like wow okay so then they focus on saying a sentence and stopping and then the ohm doesn't come out so if, if the people provide their own solution, so to speak, it, it makes it much more valuable and they feel much more uh, in control of themselves if, uh, if they have the solution. And many times I'll say that when they'll say they have a problem. I say, well, what do you think is the most logical solution? And many times they come up with a good one. Sometimes it's, it's interesting, too, as, as, as a mentor to other people, Sometimes, I mean, it's great to be available via phone all the time, but don't feel that as soon as it rings, you have to pick it up. Because many times, I've, I remember once um, a gal called me, and, and I didn't get the phone right away, and uh, I wasn't home, and I didn't hear my cell phone ring. And when I got home, I listened to her message, and she's going, oh, I have an emergency. Call me quick, 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 quick. And I said, I thought to myself, okay, that sounds really bad. So I, I called her back and I said, what do you need? She said, I figured it out. <laughs> and so I'm sure that because she figured it out, she felt much more in control than if I had 
figured it out for her. Yeah. And, and in a previous company, I had a similar thing where I was like, I, I need to be available all the time. And at the time we were growing significantly in Africa and they're not on the same time zone. And so my phone would be ringing like three, four o'clock in the morning. And, and I would, you know, just kind of like roll over and pick it up. And it, it, it does not do well. Like you're not productive and it kind of, you know, you take the power away from your, your distributors and, you know, you don't empower them to find their own solutions. So it definitely is not as productive as, as helping other people see that they already have those solutions. So I know I got a phone call once at three in the morning and I thought, Oh, my kids, what's wrong? You know, I, I said, hello, hello. And, and they, and then there was this dead silence and then they hung up and I thought, Oh, that's weird. And I didn't have my glasses on. So I didn't look at caller ID till the next morning. And it was definitely from France <laughs> and they'd forgotten it was morning for them, but it was yep. the middle of the night yet for me. So, Oh yeah. I've, I've been doing stuff out of the country for like 10 years and I'm still getting used to time zones. <laughs> Thankfully, I've never had that happen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when you when you have your downline and, and the people on your team, they, they do tend to become family. And that kind of leads into the, the family pillar, um, you know, biological family. What does a healthy family have to do with MLM? I think a healthy family is um, is so important. I mean, we look at we look at um, I like to use like maybe Donald Trump as an example. I mean, everybody thought years ago he had everything, but then his family life fell apart and then he divorced and he got married to somebody else. And I think he divorced that next one and then he got married to somebody else. So he's got these kids all over the place and a couple ex-wives and, and that's, you know, not a real healthy family situation. I mean, he, I'm sure that he's making a do and he would think it's what he needed to do and that's fine. But to me, a healthy family means that if your kids have a, a football game, you, you can go, you know, or if your kids have a birthday party, you aren't working and you aren't, you know, thinking about what you have to do and why you shouldn't be here, but you're there and you're like looking at your watch or looking at your phone and texting while you're at your, your child's uh, event. That to me is not healthy, but being able to, um, uh, I know one one weekend person who's a guy said he knew that he 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 made it when he was able to be the room father instead of the room mother and you know and when they needed some a parent to go and be like a chaperone on a class trip he would go instead of his wife and he said that was so cool because the teachers were so impressed that there was a man being a chaperone with these instead of you know, another, another mother and the kids loved it because all the little boys and even the little girls wanted to be with the daddy instead of the mommy. And so it, it's, to me, that's a healthy family. And that's, that's the reason I stay in this business. And I, and I, that's how I got, why I got in in the first place because of my boys. I wanted to help my boys um, have a good education and, and they got it. And when they graduated, they didn't owe any debts on their education, and I didn't owe any debts on their education because it was paid for as as we went. And um, and even even while they were in school, we had extra debts because of the business. We were paying off our own debts too, and so that made the stress in our own family much less because we didn't have we didn't have you know heavy bills hanging over our heads and we could do things that we wanted together as a family. Mm -hmm. To me, that's healthy family. Yeah. And I still love it because I can take care of my grandkids. My son can call me and say, hey, mom, can you pick up the kids after school for me? And I'll say, sure, no problem. If I had a nine to five job, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I was going to point out the grandkids because you know, you, you post a lot about them on Facebook and they are adorable. And, they are. And, and, and you may have gray hair, but you also have a Nintendo Wii. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I'd say, As you well, no, you play, I also have an Xbox. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, you beat me at Wii Bowling, but that's a different story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, I mean, t what's your typical day like, and what have you been able to do with your kids and your grandkids because of that, you know, freedom? Um, I said to the kids, let's go to, let's go to Disney. Uh, my youngest son who uh, was in the military at that time, he was in the army and he uh, was a doctor in the army and was getting ready to go to Afghanistan. And before he went, I decided we needed a, a family vacation. So both sons and their families, um, we all went to Disney and I was able to help, you know, fund that and uh, be able to do that kind of stuff. Um, to be able to, if, if I want to do something with the kids or go somewhere with the kids, I've got the time yeah. to do. Uh, 
I can get myself a, a stupid little things like I have an Xbox and a Connect in my house at Mima's house, and you know the kids what yeah, and they're going and and the, and the kids know how to, how to do it, and to be able to get the things that the kids love to do, the little kids love to do, and the big kids too so that they love coming to Mima's house because I've got some cool things for them to do and you know they just enjoy being here and I was at my son's one day and the boy said you know we haven't slept overnight at your house a long time Mima I said oh okay let's 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 correct that when do you want to come over so that's what makes it nice I can you know I can plan my life around my kids instead of around my work that's awesome and and I mean kind of a, it's it's a a lot of people look forward to that when they start building a multi-level marketing business, but let's talk about the other side of the coin. And, and I know you have a really great example of this and a really great, hilarious story, which is that a lot of times when you talk to your family members and you say, I'm starting this business, I'm going to work really hard, you know, maybe five years from now, we're going to be able to go to Disney and I'll have time off and we can afford to do these things. They're not always supportive of that. And yeah. I think you had a story, if I remember correctly, and this is probably three years ago so if I do remember it it's phenomenal um your sister and you were in yeah. Hilton Head Island please was, please you know, tell that story well we had we had um my sister came over and and uh she always said to me stop talking stop talking about this business I I don't want to hear anything anything more it's all you ever talk about and this was in the very beginning of the business and and she had some challenges with some arthritic problems and so I I was basically wanting to really help her with it. I wasn't trying to sell her. I was trying to give her, but she wanted, she, mm -mm, she was, she was stubborn. So I never said another word. So this was, uh, got in the business in 92 and in 98, we bought a house down in Hilton Head and moved there full time after, after my ex, uh, retired from the dentistry business. And he was doing a, a, a meeting he was out of town and coming in later and she and her husband and, and son came to visit and so it was in the days before direct deposit and um, it was near the 15th of the month when we get our check and so I, I pulled up in front of the mailbox with her on the passenger side I said would you get my, our mail out of the mailbox and she said sure so she pulled them out and I said, would you look through and find the one that's got the green check inside? I want, Roger wants me to let him know as soon as possible what the amount of the check is this month. So she opens it up and then she goes, <gasps> I mean, knock the wind out of her. And I said, what? And she said, oh my God, is this for one month? And I said, yes. And she said, is it usually this amount every month? And I said, well, how much is it? And she told me, I said, no, I was expecting more. <laughs> and she said, oh, okay. And then we got back from our errand and their best friends had been with them. And um, the best friends were not in the car with, with us when it happened. But when we got back to the house where the best friends were kind of hanging out, and we walked in, and the, the, my sister's best friend said, asked me something about me, Ken. And so I started telling her. My sister said, would you come here a minute? So we went in the kitchen. She said, if they sign up, you sign us up first, and they'll be <laughs> under us. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. So, you know, this same sister I'm taking uh, to Europe with me on Sunday. Um, on my dime because, or my nickel, I should say, because I got a whole lot of frequent flyer miles and I'm doing a Nikan meeting at Woolburn in the UK uh, for the President's Club in Europe and then doing one in France the weekend before Thanksgiving. And so I said, do you want to go along? And she said, oh yeah. <laughs> so so she's she's very excited that we're getting ready to go on, on uh, she's going to Europe for the first time. And that's only because of Niken. Couldn't do that if if I had still just, you know, still worked in a hospital or managing a dental office. It just wouldn't have happened. Yeah, and I, I, there's some some really good lessons and and jokes in there. Um, but but I think, you know, you got started in '92, and you know, I'm sure you you know you know tried to get her interested, and and then she wasn't interested, but she had health problems. And there's a lot of multi-level marketing companies that, in some way, shape, or form, help with health. And yes. when you're working with family, a lot of times I've heard this from people is that they're like, I forget selling the product. I want to give it to you. I want you to be healthy. And family members, no, 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 I, no, I don't want anything to do with that. And they're just so phobic of network marketing or multi-level marketing that they, 
they just they they don't even want to touch things. They feel like it's contagious. And and I'll, you know, I think the that's one piece to it is recognizing that, but then the other piece to it is that you waited years and then let her come to you. Granted, you seeded it, but she didn't know that. And, uh, you know, I mean, how have you seen the power in sharing that with other people when they had similar, you know, reactions from family members? Well, you know, family members are the hardest, but they're the people we want to help the most. And I think basically giving them the products to use, even if it's just for a month or two, and saying, you know, one of the things I, I've said to, to, to my brother, I said, um, I was visiting with them, and I said, you know, try this and let me know what happens, you know, because he had a physical challenge, and I said, just let me know what happens, I, I want, I want, you know, I, I, I figure if I can do it with my family, you'll tell me the truth. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. I said, but try it and use it and then tell me the truth about what really happened. And, um, you know, let's, let's talk. And so he, he was impressed too. And so, you know, when, when I said try it and tell me what happens, because uh, you'll give me the truth if you really try it, he, you know, discovered that son of a gun, these <laughs> things do work. But I, many times too, if you, if you there's positive and negatives as to being successful in the business if if you aren't yet successful in the business and you talk to your family they think you're crazy if you are successful and you talk to your family uh, there's that sibling rivalry thing and many of them figure they're not going to try it because they never catch up to you anyhow and so why should we do it you know it's not it's not it's not attractive to them because you've already done it and I'd never get and they'll, then they say, well, that's because you started so long ago, I could never do what you've done. And so it's, family is difficult. It really is difficult. Uh, sometimes, you know, the kids, my, my oldest son was a gold distributor in the Ken, um, and then his life got too busy with his, his real job, and he thoroughly enjoyed what he's doing. So I'm not going to tell him you're crazy because you enjoy what you're doing. Go ahead and do what you want to do. You have to, you know, people have to do what they want to do. You can't force somebody into the business you can't force somebody into seeing what you see yeah, sharing your vision sharing your business is fine but you can't yeah. force yeah and it's definitely not for everyone and it's not for everyone all the time I mean your proof of that is that you know you were not interested at all but it hit you at the right time and, and right time. serendipity destiny whatever you want to call it uh, you know that that happens more often than people think and sometimes yeah. when they get, get a no and they focus so hard on that no when they should just step back and instead of pushing the person away with continually asking they just step back and then six months a year whatever later uh, hey so so about that thing are you still doing that thing and you know they they come back so so yeah, speaking the guy that sponsored me yeah. quit so he yeah. lost a lot of money by quitting Oh, he quit? Yeah. Wow. Before, be, uh, you know, I, I'd reached my first leadership level, and then uh, he's one of these job hoppers, you know. He goes from thing to thing to thing, and and so he he just can't be focused, I guess. And so he he ended up dropping out, cause, and, it, you know, I ran into him maybe four years ago or five years ago, and he said, you're still doing that? I said, yeah. He said, still good? I said, I'm not going to tell you how good it is because you're going to be really sick. <laughs> and a lot, I mean, you know, the I, I've talked to people before and they look at me or they look at someone else and they go, oh, man, you're so lucky. And I'm like, it has nothing to do with luck. And if it does, it's that you make your own luck. And a lot of times the way that you do that is just by doing it for long enough. Because yeah. eventually a person talks to a person, talks to a person, talks to a person, talks to a person who, you know, is the person that hits the top rank and brings in 20,000 people over 10 years. And, and it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely powerful. And, and, and you talked about, cause I don't, um, I mean, now we're family and that's a whole different topic. Um, but, but society too, you know, that's the, the next pillar is the society pillar of wanting to help society as much as you want to help your family. And, um, what, what is meant by that? I think a lot of times if, if you think in, in your own life and the life of people that you know and um, if you support a particular charity or a particular church or some sort of organization and, uh, and, you, call, and you, you see on your caller ID that they're calling you and if you're thinking, oh shoot, I wonder what they want, 
then you don't have healthy society because usually when they're calling you, they need either funds or they need your time. And if you, you know, if if you're not, if you're stressed about your job or stressed about anything, you're not able to give either of your time or of your finances. And and to me, a healthy society is being able to give your give of your time and give of your finances as necessary. I'm very active in Meals on Wheels locally, and I deliver every Wednesday. And in the wintertime, I go in extra early every other Wednesday so I can help pack up the frozen soup for the, for the people. And um, I know that, that I was at a, I, I volunteered also to be on a committee for them for a, a function. And they said, we got to find somebody, the people who used to donate the cake, the bakery that used to donate the cake said they can't afford to do it this year. And so we got to figure out, you know. <laughs> how we're going to pay for all these cakes for this dessert for this big fundraising dinner and I said no problem I'll pay for it you know and my friend and I did it together and because uh, that was our little way of helping and they said you pay you're going to pay for it we said sure what's you know what how much can't be that much to pay for a couple cakes and it wasn't but it's the fact that I didn't have to think about it and go look at my budget to figure out if I could afford to throw a few hundred dollars here or a few hundred dollars there to help with this this charity that that I really liked to be able to do that is, is as the commercial would say it's priceless yeah. um, it's it's a friend was was doing some work for me a few quite a few years ago uh, it was when we were still down in the Carolinas and he was doing some some work in my house for me doing some painting and I said what are you up to lately and he says well we're, we're planning on going to and I can't remember the name of the country in South America and he said I said well, what are you gonna do down there he says we're gonna build a church I said that is so cool he said they don't have one and and they have their services outside so we're gonna go down and build a church for them and I said that is I said, I really respect you for doing that. And he said, I said, when are you going? He said, depends on when we raise enough money. And I said, how much more do you need? He said, $5,000. I said, done. I'm, I'm writing the check now. And he was like, you're kidding? I said, no, I'm serious. You made sure so, he was off the ladder when you said that. Right? I, he was yeah. not on the ladder. When I said <laughs> but to be able to, to see the look on somebody's face when you're able to help, yeah. Uh, and at the most important time, too. Yes. Yeah. And the same thing with the Meals on Wheels. When I deliver those meals, it's not costing me anything, just my time. But see, you know, we get to know these people really well. And if, if I miss a couple weeks in a row because I'm out of town or whatever, I get there and they say, have you been okay? What are you up? Where have you been? You know, they, they we are the, the centerpiece of their day. Sometimes we're the only people they see all day. And so to be able to give up my time for that, it's, it's cool. Yeah. I love it. And, and it's not, I mean, I, I kind of stress this because it's always hard to explain without examples, but it's not about giving, it's about giving where it counts. And and you had yeah. one story that you told me ages ago that I still, it still hit me. Um, it was about a teacher and a way that you did the same thing. And and do you remember the story that I'm talking about? Oh, there's a couple of them because kids, <laughs> the kids in reading is very close to my heart, but there was, a, there's something, one of them is there's something called donorschoice.org mm -hmm. uh, or, do, yeah, donorschoice.org. And you can donate to schools, and uh, if you you can donate just you know as little as ten dollars, and there's no overhead to speak of. If you don't want to pay overhead, you don't. But if you want to pay a little overhead, you can check to give a little overhead to the website. But um, I bought a, a, a phonics, the whole thing, because if you you know, you can fund the whole program if you want. And it was for a school in North Carolina. And um, the, the, it was not a wealthy school, and so the, the, I did it right before Christmas. Every Christmas, I like to go find something like that that's like, oh, cool. And I got all these, I think it's laying over my, over there somewhere, uh, all these thank you cards from all, each child in that classroom sent me a little, they made it out of, you know, colored paper and sent me thank you notes thanking me for the reading program and and my sister before she retired uh, was a teacher and and she taught at a parochial school they don't have a lot of money and so I'd help her set up her classroom at the beginning of the year and I'd say what do you, you need anything this year you know and uh, if she needed something instead of her having to pay for it out of her own pocket I'd do it because I could yeah. and it, and I loved doing it and so it was like okay teachers work really hard and sometimes they just don't have the money to to pay for some of the extras that they'd want to do for their kids. So, hey, I'll yeah. help them. And, and I have my, um, 
uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People sitting behind me because I'm rereading it again. And one of my favorite books, and he's um, I'm right in the beginning right now, and he's talking about how no one ever did anything because they, they wanted like they wanted to do it. They didn't do anything unless they wanted to do it. And the same thing goes for charity is that you don't give money unless you want to give it. And, um, and it's, it's because that feeling you get, you know, it's, you know, I mean, there's a variety of different reasons to do it, but a lot of times it's just because of that, that, that knowing that you impacted someone's life like that. So, I mean, is that something that's really important to you or, you know, I guess why? Yeah, I, I don't, when somebody calls me on the phone and asks for a donation, I usually, I don't give any because I don't know who this is. And I say, I pick and choose my own and I give to the charities that I know. So like the local fire companies, the local library, I mean, things that are, are near and dear to my heart and that I know need the funding just as much as anything else. And again, like the guy who was building, I know where the money is going and that's, maybe that sounds selfish in some way but I want to know where the money is going and uh, and feel that my money is doing this or that and so I, I kind of love it because you know to my local library when I send a donation they'll send me a note back saying okay we bought this book and this book and this book and you know with the money that that you donated and I'm like that's cool that's cool you know and that's uh, a, another recent book was talking about uh, how money is just man made and it's all about just giving it's a yeah. a measurement of value and that's, if if you give a hundred dollars over here just you know oh you called me up and you need some money here's a hundred dollars you know so if from the society benefit that may not be the same amount of value as a hundred dollars given to you know your painter who's going to go build a church in, in a foreign country yeah. and so perfect segue into finances um multi-level marketing i, I I once heard this and I just always loved it, but it was a uh, work for 50 years and rest for five. That's the traditional way of, you know, you have a job, you work for 50 years and you retire and you can rest for five before your health is eh, not so much. And the alternative is with multi-level marketing, you work for five years and rest for 50. But, you know, now that you've hit the top rank of the company and you're generating substantial residual income, what's stopping you from retiring? <sighs> Because I love it. I love the people, number one. And, um, you know, I still, if I see somebody who could really benefit from being in the business, I will, I, I'll talk to them about it. And I haven't personally sponsored anybody in quite a few years, but I put them, I introduce them to people in my organization and, uh, and let the people in my organization sponsor them. I mean, I still get the benefit from it, but and my business is still growing. It's just that I'm do, being able to do less. So when people say to me, oh, when are you going to retire? And I say, probably never. Because, I, in, I mean, I'm going to, to UK on Sunday. And then the Wednesday after, I'll be in, in Paris. And it's all part of the business. Why would I want to quit that? I was just in a convention in Las Vegas for the business and had a really good time. And, you know, it's, I was last, I was in Brussels and, oh, I was at the Cannes Film Festival. You saw my pictures on Facebook. And it was all because of the business. So why would I want to quit that? Because it's also, it's deductible. Yeah. I mean, there's so many financial benefits, especially um, right now it's November and getting involved with the home-based business is so important, especially in November. The financial advantages are amazing. You know, if you don't like to pay for your snow plowing, you don't have to pay for all of it if you've got a home-based business. Some of it could be deductible. So you can you can join the business now and your finances will improve even if you don't sell a single product. As long as you bought some products and you can show a loss at the end of the year, it can change your your financial assist system situation at the end of the year so that you don't pay as much income tax. Yeah. So you can end up getting more money from the government um, or paying less money to the government, I should say, just because you started a home-based business, even if you don't do a lot with it. And then you might find out, as I did, that you end up building a real business. And like, son of a gun, you know this this is this home based business stuff is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's fun, but it but it is a business. And I think um, I've seen a lot of people, and I've kind of you know I've, I've overheard and very you know reinforced the positive after the fact. But people will go and say, oh, you know, join this business, you know, and and you can work at it. You'll never have to work again. You get paid while you sleep, and that's. 
you know, not that mindset of like getting into it to just do it, be done with it and walk away forever. That doesn't really always take root. And do you, have you ever experienced that? Well, I think, and in, in when you're looking or when people get involved with network marketing, there's three classes of people that get involved. There are the pretenders. <laughs> and they have this mental list of what they're going to do and where they're going to go, but they don't really follow through with it. And 80% of the people who get involved in network marketing are pretenders. At least sometimes they start there. They may move on. And then the other classification is amateurs. And uh, the amateurs make their little list of people they're going to talk to, and it's a very short list, and they drain it quickly and say, well, this didn't work. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to do it. But then you have the professionals. And they have an active candidate list. And I, I like that better than a prospecting list, calling it a candidate list, because it, it just, to me, it sounds better. I, I'm, semantics are, are big things with me. And these professionals are always paying attention. They're always aware. And they network on purpose, so to speak. And uh, they build relationships. They educate. They inspire. And they build and transfer belief. These are the professionals. And they listen well at face-to-face -face meetings. I think it's kind of funny. Somebody said once that if you're doing a presentation or you're doing a, a talking to somebody about your business, if your lips are moving, then you should either be introducing, pointing, or reading. Other than that, you listen to what they say because if you aren't saying this or introducing or reading something then you're then what you're saying isn't a value what you're listening to is a, is a much better value so you know it's uh, it's it's a it's a good way to think about it because you want to be a network marketing professional right. not a network marketing amateur and you can be you know people don't become professionals till they have years and years of study behind them my yeah. son's a, an md and after after college, he had four years of med school, and then a couple couple three years of residency, be in internal medicine, then a couple more three year two three years two years I guess of of uh, residency again to become a gastroenterologist. So it took a long time to get where he is, and does he have a, a good job now? Yes, he does. The same thing with my other son. He's an engineer. He took him four years of going through college, and then um, what he does isn't really what his college degree prepared him for but he learned on the job while he was working and now he's you know one of the big bosses of his company because he's learned and and he's adjusted and if you want to be a professional in anything you have to learn and you have to adjust yeah and and so for someone who you know sees that and kind of hears the um they hear the difference between a pretender an amateur and a professional and maybe they acknowledge okay i'm, I'm a little bit of a pretender or maybe i'm a little bit of an amateur uh, what is something that they can take action on today to start moving themselves towards being a professional? Well, you 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 have to set a real goal. I mean, and you have to have a good vision. You have, like I said in the very beginning, you have to know where you're going, and you know what you're going to do, how you're going to get there, where you're going, we're going to go, and you set your you set your daily goals, and like you read every day. Um, I've got. In fact, that's why it took me a while to find find this book because I got a bookshelf over here with things like uh, "Think and Grow Rich," as you talked about, and uh, uh, the complete classic text. Oh, I got two of them. Get this. Look at this. This is cool. I got the modern "Think and Grow Rich," but I have a classic "Think oh, and Grow." Now so, I want that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you have, and then I have another shelf of books over there. I have a shelf of books behind me. So every day you should read something. Um, readers are learners. Readers can also, they, they can help their business. You do some calls. Um, keep a list. We were talking about being a professional. I, 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 obviously, if you're listening to this, you have a computer. So on your, on your Outlook or on your calendar, Whatever you do, you can have a business calendar and your personal calendar. They should be two separate things. Unless you're doing this full time like me, then they, they meld because they're very close to being the same. But on your calendar, you put down, if you talk to somebody, put it down, write everything down because you want on your, you want ever at the end of every month, you want to print up your calendar and look at it. And see if you have a full calendar or a fool's calendar, because you're only fooling yourself that you're really doing the business. And then you keep that. I have, I have that um, 
all every year I have those printed up. This is this, you know, and it, it's, it, yeah. I print them up. It's in case I ever get audited by the IRS, they can see what I do on a daily basis. Yeah. And it also is good for you. And it's, and it's good if your sponsor says, well, what are you doing? You can pull your little calendar out and say, here's the printout of what I've done. What should I do more of? Yeah. And you can talk about auditing and that's, that's important because you, you get audited by the IRS. That's one thing, but if you audit yourself, then yes. that's another and that was actually mentioned or is mentioned in uh, uh how to win friends and influence people i think is it uh looking at someone successful and i don't remember the guy's name but uh he went through and he would write down everything he did every day and then yes. at the end of the week on the exact same day and the exact same time he would go back through and, and look at it and be like is that something that i i can be proud of myself i actually uh wrote it down in my I actually with like a wrote pen, it. like one a, uh, with a pen, one of those old fashioned things that looks like this. Yeah, you have I one. That. Oh, that's rare. I do. Yeah, I do. I when I get really, really serious and decide, okay, I'm gonna be really getting some do some stuff. I'll actually write it down by because it makes me. Yes, I can put it on the computer, but if I put it, I put it on the computer and I write it down because at the end of each day, writing down what I want to do, it seems to imprint on me a lot more. Uh, than if just typing it in the computer because I can look at that and it's I wrote it in my own handwriting and I put my goals in my own handwriting and I can look at it and it, it means a lot more than seeing the list on the screen on my computer and it's there but it's also in there yeah that's awesome and and thank you so much I mean I the the advice that you share the stories and and I think stories are really impactful because they hit people and you know case in point they stay with people for four years um I mean I can't believe I remember the story about your sister and the location and and details yeah. um and it's probably because I shared it again and again but thank you so much I'm gonna put your uh, your I'm social sure. links your website uh links to our podcast and all the books all of the books that we talked about um but thank you and uh look forward to having you on again soon Bye-bye. <laughs>